What's really important is for is for the team that works with this grieving coworker to get some guidance on that. And the best way to do that is to either have the manager or a close friend of the grieving coworker talk to that person about what helps and what doesn't in the workplace. So for example, you might go back to work and you might feel very comfortable having your coworkers come up to you, even if they fumble and, you know, as you said, stumble over what they say, say the wrong thing, whatever. That, that expression of condolence and sadness for what's happened is okay with you. Whereas other people, there is nothing that you can say. They do not want to talk about it at work. Hello, and welcome to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. This podcast is about exploring the grief that occurs at different times in our lives in which we have had major changes and transitions that literally shake us to the core and make us experience grief. I created this podcast for people to feel a little less hopeless and alone in their own grief process as they hear the stories of others who have had similar journeys. I'm Kendra Rinaldi, your host. Now, let's dive right in to today's episode. On today's episode, I have the pleasure of interviewing Margot Folks. She is the founder and president of On Target, and she is the author of Leading Through Loss, How to Navigate Grief at Work. And I am excited to have this conversation with you today, Margot. Welcome. Thank you so much, Kendra. I'm a huge fan of your podcast, so I'm very excited to be here. I appreciate you saying that, and thank you for being here and now sharing your own journey and then this book that you have that, you know, this is a first. This is the first time I believe I have a book that is about really navigating grief in the workspace. So thank you for this beautiful piece of work that will help other people as they themselves are grieving, if they have coworkers, if they're the boss, if they, you know, just any any type of work dynamic. And before we started recording, I said, wait, I, I, you know, I was like, I've been the boss and had grieved. And I just had realized, I'm like, when I had my miscarriage, I actually owned a children's gym at the time and I was the boss. And this would have been very helpful for me to have read then. <laughs> so thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I think it's something, if we don't have a resource and we're in the middle of it, I think we just soldier through, right? We just sort of figure it out. And sometimes, depending on the circumstances, we just kind of put it out of our mind once we either eventually change the job or just feel like we're kind of mostly back to our old self. And and so in one way, I'm not surprised that you that you don't remember because you probably just got through it as best you could. As we probably all do in life, right, as you said, in any of these circumstances, it's the first time we are, even with parenting, it's the first time we are parenting a child that is one, a first time that we're doing it, and we're just kind of going through it, and we don't have a manual for everything. And again, because even, I believe you say this in your book, you know, grief is as unique as your finger uh, print, that it will be unique also. So even as someone that might be in the workspace and you have a manual, you might encounter something that is completely different than you even thought, right? So oh, absolutely. Navigating. Absolutely. I mean, think about it in the context of, you know, if a coworker were to die, that even though everyone on that team in that workplace is grieving exactly the same loss, the same person, they will grieve the the absence and the death of their coworker in very different ways. And in and especially too, because for each individual, it may bring up different things. So someone might remember even the loss of someone in their family as they're grieving the loss of the coworker. And you might be like, why is this why why is Kendra crying so much? She barely talked to that person, but you don't know what other things might be even bubbling up in that in that experience of that grief right it kind of exactly. just opens up the door for all these other emotions and the other thing it opens up the door as well when we go through that is of our own mortality yes 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, particularly, I mean, you think about it, if you're a young person in particular and you lose someone that's close to your age or even younger, you know, and you and maybe you haven't had a lot of experience with loss, you know, or at least people that are younger who've died that you knew, that can be pretty terrifying to, to realize that this young person has passed away, particularly if, if the circumstances are such that it's not something where you can think, well, that's not going to happen to me. Now let's talk about your own life and your journey. So tell us about you. Where do you live right now? In Sacramento, California. Okay. And Cal- is that where you grew up? I grew up in San Jose, actually. Okay. And we've, li- we've lived in Sacramento. We, when my husband and I got married, we moved to Sacramento. And then we spent 10 years up in Portland and then moved back to Sacramento when our son started college. As we're recording, this is just during the time of a lot of flooding and rains. Uh, were you guys okay in your area where you were at with all the? Yes, rain? we okay. had we had a number of trees come down, but it, up here we're a little bit higher because we actually live to the east of Sacramento proper, and so with the elevation, it's muddy and we have some spot flooding, but nothing like what they're experiencing down in Sacramento proper. In other in other areas, okay. Mm-hmm. So tell take us into your own family dynamics. Your you mentioned your husband, so tell us about your own family circle, and we're going to talk about your own personal experience with grief and how that also inspired you now writing this book. Sure. So my husband Dan and I met in college um, and have been and got married um, about three years after we grad. I'm sorry, five years after we graduated. And we had two children, um, our son, Jimmy, who was first, and then our daughter, Molly. And until Jimmy's early teen years, we were a pretty normal family with two kids. And when he was 13 and a half, we were on vacation in Hawaii, and he had been getting these increasingly intense headaches. And I'd been on the phone with the pediatrician's office and they kept saying, oh, we think it's dehydration. You know, it's probably nothing, but bring him in when when you get back. And so after a week of trying to figure out what it was, the pediatrician eventually ordered an MRI just to rule out anything. And we discovered that Jimmy had a brain tumor and that that's what was causing all the problems. And so over the course of the next eight years, he went through the initial treatment, he had a year off, and then the cancer returned. And then he spent the remainder of that time on and off different kinds of treatment. And for most of those years, he actually did fairly well in terms of being able to be in in high school and graduate, and he went to college for two and a half years. But in that final year of his life, the combination of just the, I think the accumulation of all those intense treatments and also just the impact of the cancer growing more aggressively had him come home for his final year of his life. And then he died in February of 2014. So we're actually coming up now on the on the nine year anniversary of that, which I can almost hardly believe. It's in it just so odd, like this concept of time too within that, right? It's like mm-hmm. what nine? I you can remember certain things as if they were yesterday, probably. Right. I'm sure in that journey. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for sharing Jimmy with us, and for him probably being this catalyst for you to now do what it is you do in your life. So when you were navigating your grief, were you in the workspace at that time? I was, but not for every, every moment of it. Um, I, I worked up until he got into the later stages of, of his treatment and his and his journey with cancer. Um, we got to a point where the combination of his need for treatment and how he was feeling and the need for me to do some research on different options, because there's so few children in the situation that he was in with this kind of brain tumor, that I wound up putting pa- pushing pause on my work. And then I went back to it um, after a couple years after he died, I went back to work. And for your husband, that the same, did he have flexibility to be able to do that as well as you were navigating grief or 
how was it for him? We basically, we sort of balanced it back and forth. So in the, in the first year of his treatment, the initial treatment, I continued to work and Dan had been in the process of changing jobs and decided that he was going to take a bit of time off so that if Jimmy, when he was at school, for example, suddenly not started not feeling well and needed to come home, Dan wanted to be available to him. And he also wanted to spend more time with our daughter since he he works in sales for, for startups. He'd been traveling a lot and he really wanted the time with her as well. So he took off a year and stayed home. I continued to work. Then he went back to work. And then towards the very end of Jimmy's life, he did take a leave of absence from his company to be home for that as well. So it was kind of a, almost a flow in and out of the workplace for both of us during those years. What a blessing to some extent that you had that uh, flexibility to be able to take time for yourself because, again, not everybody does. Tell us some facts in terms of what most companies give people in terms of grief, grief time. What are some of the regular hours that most companies give? Two weeks, a week? What, what are some of these statistics that you've come across? So after someone dies, and this, this assumes that someone is someone defined as close, meaning a child, a parent, you know, a sibling, the average in this country is three to four days of bereavement oh, leave, which is nothing. And there's still companies and organizations apparently that don't offer any leave. Although I have to say in all the conversations that I've had with the people I interviewed and other people I've talked to about the book, I have not run across someone who said to me, my company would not give me any time off. But officially, it's three to four days. And then it's up to the manager about how much time they're able to offer off. Sometimes it's not even within their control. So I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, it's purely just a a person making this decision, you know, it's sometimes there's just, there's constraints and they're not able to offer much time off at all. That is just uh, uh, like, whoa, like amazing to me to think that it's just that short period. Now for some people, work does become the way that they cope. I know that I have a friend's husband who the day after dad, his dad died, like he, he didn't even tell his coworkers and he went to work the next day that he needed that he needed that routine in his own grief journey that is what that person needed everybody's so different again but some might need so much longer in 3 or 4 days like you're barely even able to do some of the business or administrative things that have to do regarding even you know the process of someone dying like a home, uh, you know, a, a, you know, bur burial, this, that. It's just incredible that it's only that few days. It is. It is. And, and now I want, there are a few companies that have, that are giving more time, but it's, it, it's, it's not as it, it, it should, we should mandate more time off for mm -hmm. folks because it really isn't, it isn't enough. And then with the option, as you said, of course, there were people I interviewed who said, I took a week maybe two. And then I went back to work because I, that's what I needed. I needed the routine. I needed my coworkers. And some of them talked about their loss at work. And some of them said it was the place I could go for nine hours, eight hours where I didn't have to think about it. People, I knew no one would bring it up and I could just be there and have, and, and try to focus and get some work done. Right. And then for some, that even that in itself, when people go back into their workplace, there's still so much judgment sometimes to about it, right? Oh my goodness. How can she be here already? If her child, it, like there's just so much judgment, regardless if we take too long to grieve, if we do it too quickly, if we go back into our routine, talk about that aspect of judgment and what you've noticed even for yourself. And as you were interviewing these different people, did that come up? Oh, it, it did. Absolutely. I, I mean, if you think about it, just with any loss, even in our personal lives, we have this habit of humans is thinking, oh, Kendra just lost her mother. Why is she doing this? I wouldn't do that. Right. 
as opposed to allowing the other person some grace in making the decision that's best for them. So I, I agree there's absolutely different kinds of judgment. And what gets layered on top of that is the ways in which we we judge other people, other losses, meaning that we each have this sort of hierarchy, I think, of which losses are worse than others. And I, when, my, when my son died, of course, people, most people would say that to lose a child is the worst possible loss. And so... I never experienced any of that, of course, because of because it was my son who had died. But a year later, when my mother died, I got a lot of people who very who meant it with all the best intention, saying things like, "Oh, but she had such a long, full life." And while that was true, and had she died without my having lost my son, I probably wouldn't even have thought about it. But inside, what I was thinking is. But my son is dead and my mother is one of my most important people. And now she's not here either. And so this loss was so much bigger than it would have been had the circumstances been different. And it's not that people should know or understand that, but we bring that kind of, of judgment and ranking into work, often unintentionally and sometimes without even being aware of it. And then we layer all that on this person who has come back. And, and we, we judge them, basically. And that happens to even more when it's, um, as I'm petting my dog here who just came to say hi, when it's a, a pet, for example. A pet, somebody could be like, what? Why, why would they need time off if it's their pet? But that pet could have been the only companion that person had in their life as well. And what that pet meant to that individual was much more than any other even person sometimes in their life because that was their person quote unquote that you know not a person their pet but I you know what I I mean by that so yes it's it is something we have to all be very watchful of and though for us it may not be that big like even with my miscarriage I remember me reflecting how I had felt for my miscarriage and when another friend had her miscarriage and she's like, Oh no, I'm fine. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Cause I was projecting how I had felt for mine. Right. right? And onto her and for her, it was a different experience or at least she said so. So yeah, it is, uh, it is very tricky. Now let's talk about some of those things. If someone's in the workspace and one of their coworkers has had a loss, you give a lot of tips of the things to say or not to say, what are some things that we should try, I'll just say the word try, because of course we never know what's going to come out of our mouths. Right. I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. I still say the wrong things, even if I know the right thing to say. Cause <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Because <laughs> we get flustered, we get nervous, and sometimes those emotions get in and we just say it without thinking. But what are some of these tips that you say in the book of things not to say? So I want to step back actually one step before that, which is Please. one of the things I talk about in the book too, is that what's really important is for, is for the team that works with this grieving coworker to get some guidance on that. And the best way to do that is to either have the manager or a close friend of the grieving coworker talk to that person about what helps and what doesn't in the workplace. So for example, you might go back to work and you might feel very comfortable having your coworkers come up to you, even if they fumble and, you know, as you said, stumble over what they say, say the wrong thing, whatever, that that expression of condolence and sadness for what's happened is okay with you. Whereas other people, there is nothing that you can say. They do not want to talk about it at work. And one of the mistakes I think that leaders make sometimes is they they don't get out in front of that. And so what happens is the grieving coworker comes back to work and they are at the mercy of what people say to them and when. So imagine you're going into a meeting, you're about to give a presentation and one of your colleagues pulls you aside and says, oh, Kendra, I heard about your miscarriage. I'm so sorry. And while it's lovely and meaningful, now you're thinking about your miscarriage, you may cry, you may get emotional, and you've got to go in and give this presentation. So I think what's most helpful is to get some advice 
and, and direct counsel from the person who's grieving and then share that with the team. And people will still make mistakes because we're human and we do that. But at least you can avoid the bulk of them by getting that kind of counsel. And then I think beyond that, as you know, the thing that's, that's important is just to share your sadness that this has happened. If the person feels comfortable sharing a bit about the person they've lost, then that's a lovely thing to ask about as well. I think one of the things to stay away from are questions about the circumstances. Because then, I don't know about for you, but for me, when, when people asked a lot about you know how Jimmy died or what that was like, I felt like we were focusing on his death and instead of the way he lived and who he was as a person. And in that moment, too, it becomes more about the curiosity of the individual sometimes more than, you know, kind of meeting that curiosity that we have in our in our mind, that thing of like, oh, I wonder what happened and kind of numbing that out rather than really about the grief of the individual that's right. going through that. And and it and it's normal to be curious, right? But sometimes it's, it's normal. It's part of our human nature to be curious. But right. that that in itself can minimize sometimes also just the experience itself of the grief of the individual. And you're more focusing on the how, how it happened, and you know, and what happened. Thank you for that, and for going back and ex and going through that aspect of explaining that the boss should call the, you know, the, that kind of the boss or project manager, call the individual, kind of get a sense for what it is they feel comfortable as they come back to the workspace so that then they can talk to the team and be prepared as to what it is um, that you will be approaching and how to approach the situation for that. Exactly. So, Which makes you know. everyone feel more comfortable because as yes. you, you know, you and I live in this space of grief and loss. And so, it's not that I still don't get nervous about talking to someone who's had a, a terrible, heartbreaking loss, but I've done it enough that I'm I'm going to do it even if I'm nervous. But for many of us, the thought of talking to someone who's been shattered by something is really terrifying. And so to have to go into that with no guidance at all, what what tends to happen is people don't say anything because it is just too scary. And the fear of saying the wrong thing or upsetting you know, their colleague at work is greater than you know, the, the, the feeling of, I need to do this. They, and they actually oftentimes will make the judgment that it's better not to say anything because I'll get it wrong, I might upset her. And then that person then is sitting there at work knowing everyone knows and no one's saying anything. Mm -hmm. And might, yeah, make, make things worse than we thought. The, one of the uh, tips here towards the end, contact your employee as soon as you hear the news. And you mentioned about different forms of communication, not, not just assuming that if they got the voice text, the voicemail or the email. So sending different types of messages to make sure that they know you've tried to reach them if you're the 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 boss. Were there different stories like that that might have occurred in which somebody might have just assumed that the employee had received, let's say, via email, but they're probably bombarded with other emails they never got, then come to the workspace probably, and they're like, my boss never reached out, but you really didn't try enough as a boss. <laughs> You know, I didn't hear that so much as I think when someone reaches out to us by a certain medium, the expectation is that we respond in the same one. So if you call mm. and leave me a voicemail, I'm going to call you back. And if I don't feel like I can talk on the phone very easily, then I may, you know, it's hard for me to return the phone call. Whereas if you reach out in a couple ways and maybe you use Slack or text or email and phone, then the, the person you're trying to get a hold of has the option of what's more comfortable. And I always think phone conversations are better because you have that live interaction where they, the other person might say something, it might spark a different question. You know, there, it's a richer conversation. But your grieving employee may not be able to handle that at that point. And so then you've sent a message, no pun intended, that, you know, that texting is fine as a way of, mm. of sorting out the details of the return to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, thank you for, for clarification with that. It's more about whether the individual feels actually comfortable responding 
in a text or a call or yeah. So you're giving them the options of responding in any of these forms by reaching out in it in several ways as well to exactly. them. Exactly. So exactly. No, that that that's a great clarification. Yeah. Let's well, talk and the about other the, thing, yeah. too, okay. Kendra, just one other thing to add as well is that is it you know is because we don't get a lot of time off. The, and then we are also trying to grieve this loss. Our days can get all upside down. And so your employee might want to get back to you at one o'clock in the morning when they can't sleep. And that might be the first time when they feel like, oh, I've got to respond to that email or that text. But if you have only phoned them and they feel the need to return the phone call, then then unintentionally you've limited them to calling you during those work hours which may or may not be a good time to return the phone call. So again, it just gives people more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Very important, especially, yeah, for, for a grieving person, which time, as we know, has really <laughs> no, no concept in those moments at all. Let, let's talk about the education of grief in the workspace, because how often, even though, yes, let's say someone, let's say it's your, your new boss, you're a new boss, it's a new company, and it's the first time someone has a loss and all of a sudden here you are, oh my goodness, this is something that's not in my manual of like how to navigate. What research do, do what resources do I use and who do I get to come and talk about grief in the workspace? Let's go into that please of how can a person that's in that position, project manager, you know, or boss be able to educate their staff about grief? So I think it's helpful to bring in someone like me to talk about that because I think there are questions that potentially are more comfortable to ask someone, you know, outside of the workforce um, in that way so that it doesn't put the onus on the boss. Um, I also think it can be really helpful to reach out to other people that you know who've dealt with something similar and use them as the resource. And they may also be, depending on the circumstances, they may also be a good person to come in and talk to the team. You know, their experience is not going to necessarily be broad in terms of the grief aspect so much. But if they have experience, for example, in how to support a grieving team or a grieving an employee, then that practical experience of, you know, here's what we did well, and boy, here's where we made mistakes, and these are the things I wouldn't do again, that that's so useful. Because it's, you know, I think we sometimes get this notion that we're supposed to be perfect as we're navigating grief, whether it's inside or outside the workplace. And as you know, that's just not possible. So it really helps to learn from other people and, and what they've done that's worked and what hasn't. So as you're saying, someone like you, so just again, because you, let's talk about what it is you do, because you are an author, but let's talk about your your business and how it is that you are able then with your company, support companies or things like that to educate about grief. So I've been, I've been a consultant now for almost 25 years. And I think I bring, part of my unique experience is that I was doing work around grief and loss before I would have named it that because I started my, my practice in the late 90s and it was in the, the heyday of layoffs, which I'm sad to say we are in the midst of again right now as if we did not learn anything from, from those mm -hmm. days. And there was a lot of talk about right sizing and downsizing and trimming the fat as if we were not eliminating people's jobs and that as if these people didn't have mortgages and children and retirement looming. And so I used to get hired by companies to go in and do trainings to work with the leadership that was left and the team that was left in order to rebuild the morale, which, as you can imagine, is shattered by a layoff. Because even if you survive it, you know, some percentage of your teammates are no longer there. You very often are friends with them. You know, their circumstances. So you're yeah, sad about right. that. You're grieving. You're that's grieving grief right there. You're right? grieving, exactly. right. You're grieving. Wow. You're grieving that your friend is not working there anymore. You're grieving the fact that, wow, that could have been me too, not having a job at this moment. Okay. So yeah, so you definitely were dealing with grief just in a different 
uh, a different way. But yes, continue, please. Exactly. And so I did a lot of work around that. And it didn't, at the time, I'm sure I never used the word grief. I probably did use the word loss, you know, that it's a loss, that the change has happened that, you know, you're now taking on more work, your friend is gone, et cetera. But I, I didn't really think about it in the same terms. But when I came back to my practice after Jimmy died, and I also at the same time, I launched Saltwater, which is my online community and blog about for anyone who's lost someone dear to them. I started to see those links much more clearly. And I started to find myself using examples from my grief experience when I was talking to organizations. So for example, during COVID, I did a lot of work with clients who were faced with cutting jobs, with cutting back on programs, with making significant changes because of the impact of everything being closed. And I found myself this time around using grief and loss and even telling some aspect of my experience with Jimmy as an illustration of what they were going through. And so I really started to see that connection more clearly. And I think it's one of the things that I bring that's a bit unique in that I'm not a therapist or a, you know, a psychologist. So if you wanted your team to have training on, the, on, you know, on that aspect of grief, I am not the right person because I don't have that background. But what I have is all these years of experience of working with people who have ha experienced all kinds of loss, both death for sure, but also the other losses that we experience at work and in, and in learning how to help organizations rebuild a team, rebuild morale, come back together in the face of it. Mm. No, it's so important. And I, I like, as you're talking about just in general, everything you you bring up this quote that I like as consultant Alan Wise says, we don't have a personal life and a work life. We have a life. So all of these things just make up what our life is and how it says coworkers can become some of our closest friends. And so to not necessarily, even as someone that maybe you, maybe you don't go into a workspace and you see, let's say your spouse going through the grief of, the loss of a coworker to really know that for them, this is something important too. So even as someone that might not be in that arena, again, being very mindful that someone that might've shared a desk space with your spouse or with your friend was just as important as even you might be, <laughs> you might be to them. <laughs> So exactly. Respect exactly. to navigate that with them. So, okay, let's go into talking more about what led you then to write this book. What was that catalyst of like, I'm going to write a book now about it. I've helped people out. Tell us the journey about creating this resource. So I would say it was a combination of two things that came together. One was that one of my pet peeves and one of the reasons I started Saltwater was that I am not a fan of these lists that people create that are titled things like the 25 things you should never say to a grieving mother. Because I read those lists and I think, okay, sure, you know, some of these are pretty heinous, absolutely. But at the same time, I envision somebody who loves me reading that list and thinking, okay, well, if I'm not supposed to say these things, what am I going to say? And knowing that all they're going to be able to think about is what's on the list to not say, and it will silence them from saying anything because they'll be worried that whatever they do say is actually on the list. And I see that a lot at work, right, where you it manifests in that fear that we've already talked about, about people saying different things. Um, so that would say that was a really big thing. The other element of this is that as I was working with people it, who were joining Saltwater and connecting with me, we would talk about their experiences going back to work. It would just seem to come up naturally because it's, it's such a big part of our lives. And over and over again, the most consistent thing I heard, no matter how much time off they had or how wonderful their, their team was or their boss was, was I went back to work and no one said anything. And I thought, of course not, because 
we don't know what to say and we don't know what to do. And so I got the idea to write a book that would help people navigate that without wagging my finger and without saying, don't do these things. The book is all about what you should say, what you, what you should do. And in most cases, I don't give a lot of advice about what to say. I encourage people to ask questions and to, and to turn to the person who's actually grieving for guidance on how to proceed rather than trying to figure it out in a vacuum. It's so well said. And yes, I think when I asked that other question before of what not to say, I literally think you only wrote like three little things of the not. All the rest were like things of ideas of of what. It was literally so close. And you're so right. We get so caught up. It's like that saying like, don't don't think of the purple monkey, you know, the purple elephant and the monkey sitting on its back. What's your brain going to do? Think of the purple. So, so yeah, so when we're so focused on the don't, <laughs> we might either, that's all we think of and it might just paralyze us, as you mentioned. Let's um, go over some of these things that grief, the impact that grief has in the workspace in terms of productivity and things like that as well, like in terms of individuals, because we go through so much, right, as individuals, that if we were to have a plan per se in place to be able to support a grieving person, it could also lower the impact even financially for a company, for a business. You talk a, you talk about that in your book. Can you go over just briefly about that? Absolutely. There, there will be an impact. It, it will be harder for the grieving employee to focus, to concentrate. They'll be distracted. They'll make more mistakes. It's just a given that that happens. And, but the power of supporting that person is that they will navigate that period more effectively and they will come out of it sooner with the right kind of support. I also think that there are ways to, to help that person be more productive because if the person's back at work, whether it's because it's their safe place and they want to be there or because simply they have to be there because they are an important breadwinner for the family, there are accommodations that can get made for that person that can allow them to be more productive in certain ways that might be easier for them and to take certain things off their plate. And the example I often give is that, you know, for me, talking on the phone was really difficult after Jimmy died because I never knew when someone was going to say something that then would have me get upset, right? So offering your employee the opportunity to be on the phone less and, and do more work that involves either them working alone or with people that they know well in the workplace, for example, might enable them to remain more productive. Being flexible is really important. I mean, I mentioned that idea of, you know, emailing the boss back at one o'clock in the morning. I know for me, oftentimes I didn't sleep well. And so if I had something that was due and I couldn't sleep, I might stay up late. I might get up you know, early when I woke up. And that kind of flexibility to get your work done as opposed to saying, no, you must be in the office from this period of time to this period of time and it must, be get, must get done then. Those kinds of accommodations can go a long way. And then finally, I think providing some support. Um, a number of the people I talked to said that someone would check their work for them just to make sure, you know, before the important letter went out or before the spreadsheet got turned in, that the numbers were right or there weren't any typos. That kind of help is so welcome because it's almost when you're grieving, it's almost like you can't see the mistake because your brain is just not functioning the way it normally would. So I think that kind of support can be helpful too. And it's also good for the employee because then they don't feel like, oh, I'm back at work, but I'm I can't get anything done or I can't do anything right. And then that that also hurts their mental state because it, you know, it's one more layer on top of the grief that they're feeling. And and it's so important also to just check in back, like kind of loop back into it. You might have had that conversation with your employee or, you know, before they started to work and maybe they shared that this is how they'd like to be supported in their grief. Maybe things have 
maybe things have changed. Maybe once they're back in their workspace, they realize, wait, I did, I had said I did want people to ask about my mom or about the, whatever, and now I realize I don't. So checking back in with your employee to see how it is they're feeling being back and whether the approach that the team is doing is helping support them in that process would also be super helpful too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and it also calls to mind something important too that you're you're touching on um, indirectly, which is I think so often companies think, oh, this is going to be expensive to support this employee who's grieving. You know, they're not going to be as productive. I can't give them all this time off. But so often what's most helpful are things that don't cost money, which are things like checking in really frequently. And it doesn't mean that you know you and I have to sit down for a two hour meeting so I can see how you're doing. It might be a very quick five to 10 minute check-in just to say, you know, how are you navigating work right now? What, do you, what can I do to support you? Is there anything that you need changed or anything like that? And sometimes there were, there were examples in the book where that happened. And the person said, you know, I never took advantage of any of those offers, but to know that they were there was enough, that I had the option on a bad day to go home, even though I never did, was huge. And that is so important to make sure that this person, this individual is actually content. I'll just use the word content, let's say, with the process and how they are being um, supported because even though for an employer, they may think that it's expensive to support a grieving person. Is it not more expensive to try to find a replacement once this person feels unhappy and leaves? Because can you touch on that? How much does it cost for them to then hire someone to the, one of these, um, what is it called? What are those things called that hire people? Search firms. <laughs> Yeah. Like, what is that called? You can know I'm not in that. You can know I'm not in that world when I'm like, what is that called? So uh, what, for example, how much would it cost for someone to put an ad or to find a search group to just rehire someone else? So it might take way less to hire someone like you to come in, educate your yourself as an employer and your staff about grief and support the grieving person than to try to then find someone else to replace this individual that might have not felt supported in the workspace and leaves. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a huge cost to that, which is not just the monetary cost of retaining the search firm and paying the fee for that, but it's also the time it takes for that new person to get up to speed to the same level of productivity that the person was who left. But there's also, there's a secondary cost to that too which is just as we are making judgments as humans about other people, we also watch very closely. And so if you come back to work grieving the loss of someone and our respective manager is not supportive, then what I'm going to think to myself is, ooh, wow. So if this happens to me and my mom is sick maybe and, and maybe this, you know, it's not going to be that far off, this is how I'm going to get treated. Or even just looking at it and saying, is this the kind of place I want to work where my, my dear friend who's back at work is grieving and she's being treated terribly and nobody's doing anything about it. So it has a big impact on the organization. And I think for the, for the bosses sometimes who tend to look away or think, well, you know, I sent flowers, I went to the service, I sent a card. Now I just kind of don't really, you know, it's, Kendra seems okay, so I'm just not going to bring it up or, or mention it. They underestimate the cost of, of acting that way and the impact and the damage that it does. So, so, so important what you said. It's the ripple effect it has, yes, on the whole, the whole team if it's not uh, handled the best way possible. Margo, is there something I have not asked you regarding the aspect of the workspace or the work you do that you'd like to make sure that our listeners take away? Any other tips that you may have? So I'll, what comes to mind is this new work from home hybrid workspace 
that we're all living in. Okay. Now, or yes. Most How do we are, handle right? that Zoom? Yeah. How do you handle on Zoom when you're grieving? <laughs> okay. Exactly. Exactly. Because we, what we've, one of the things that we've lost is the inability to both do a very quick check-in with someone who's struggling about anything that that's going on in their life. And also it's hard to notice when that's happening. So if I'm having a team meeting and there's 30 little squares on the screen and you're either never looking up at the camera or your eyes are red, or maybe you don't even have your camera on, I might not even notice. Or if I notice the camera being off, I might think, oh, well, maybe Kendra got up late and, you know, it isn't really dressed appropriately for this call, but she's here, which is fine. So I, I might not even, it might not even occur to me that you were struggling. And so what's important in this environment when you're, when you have someone who's, who's having a struggle about anything is to check in much more frequently. And if possible, particularly now where we're, you know, past those really awful days of 2020 and 2021 is to get together in person. If you can, if you're close by periodically, because there's just a different conversation that happens when you're sitting, you know, across a table over a cup of coffee, you know, in a, in somewhere in a corner of an office, talking to someone one-on-one, there's a conversation that happens. It just doesn't happen as easily when you're on the phone or on zoom. Extremely important what you said. And you're right. It's this new normal quote unquote, that it's just become more common for work to be hybrid or to be completely from home. And a boss might not, you might not even tell your boss sometimes because you might not even take time off because, well, you're on a computer. So you might not even take the time off you need because you're not going to the workspace and you're like, well, I have to go sit with my mom as she's sick, but I just take my computer with me. So, you know, even if you're traveling, you still might log into work. It it just, yeah, it, it, it kind of, separate, it doesn't give that separation of work. Well, we talked about work-life balance, you know, a little bit too, because of the fact that you're constantly able to quote unquote connect. Yes, that's so true. And I didn't even think about that, Kendra, but that's such an important point, which is that if you want to keep the fact that someone you care about is dying or even has died to yourself, it's much easier to do. And I, I can see how, you know, that, that might feel appealing, but the problem is, is that we don't have these separate lives. And so it will bleed into work and how you're feeling and how you're functioning. And you won't have that support, like you said, because if you have not mentioned, and then who is going to check, like you said, there could be errors. And when you're sending an email to, and there's nobody to know, to kind of double check your work as you're doing this presentation, there could be more mistakes just because you wanted to keep it to yourself. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing for the whole company as a whole. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be, you know, you know, share a little more about your personal life because it does have an impact in the work environment too. Sometimes people think that if I tell people I'm going through something, you're you're putting it on them. But the reality is that it will impact them if you don't tell them too. Exactly. Well, and they'll make a judgment about, you know, maybe you're slacking off. Maybe you're looking for another job instead of realizing that you're going through something. Yeah. And that you need is support instead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Margot, I want to go now back into personal, your personal life. And if you can share with us an anecdote or story or memory of Jimmy with us, please. Oh, let's see. Jimmy had had the best sense of humor. And that's the first thing that comes to mind because he would come out with these really funny comments sometimes. And so this is sort of random, but it's what it comes to mind when I think of the, when you, I think of your question. So he had to go through a second round of radiation after his cancer recurred. And we were, we were back down here and he was being treated at UC San Francisco. And so we would stay in this place called family house, which at the time was about 10, 10 fairly long blocks from the hospital. 
And I had this idea, which I think was right, that getting exercise was good for him. And so we would walk up there in the morning and walk back. And then a lot of times if he had a second appointment, we'd walk back up in the afternoon. And one day I decided that in between those two walks, we were going to walk over to the grocery store, which I thought was a lot closer than it was. And we wound up doing something like six miles that day. What? And he, he looked at me on the way back. He was so tired because he was going through treatment. He looked at me and he said, Mom, I think it's time we saw other people. <laughs> Which I just like he was like he was breaking up with you. <laughs> exactly. Like this is it. It's over. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And can you tell us also in that aspect of him having also come back from college and then, you know, taking a semester off, how was it for you guys to even notify professors and school and that part too, as a parent of a child that's already grown, leaving their environment and then passing away? Did he take off when he came back? Did he just take a semester off? Like he just or just, you know, when, when he came back from school? Yeah, he took a leave of absence, a leave um, of absence. For, for spring quarter of his junior year. And then he passed away the following year. So yeah, we so, did, we did, I, I did let a number of people that knew him at school, professors, advisors, people like that. No, in fact, I did actually let them know before he died so that, that if they wanted to, they could send a note to him, which many of them did. So that, and, you know, we could share those with him. And even there in that type of workspace then too, for educators, when one of their students dies, you know, that is also so impactful also for them too, right? That's right. another part to have into consideration in a work, workspace environment is if you're a principal of a school or, you know, a dean at a college, right to have in mind that it does have an impact on professors when students die as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for sharing a little piece of, of Jimmy's humor with us. And again, on your, your journey, let's tell people how they can get a hold of you and I'll make sure to put all the links below. And it's been so helpful. I didn't want to go too much into detail about the book, but I guess I still ended up going like, oh, tell us about this part of that. But people definitely have to grab the book. So Margo, let them know how it is they can get a hold of the book and get in touch with you if they feel they need your services as well. So the easiest way is to go to ontargetconsulting.net because there's a, a page in there about the book. And then there's also resources on the resource page about dealing with grief at work. And then for those who are interested in connecting with me, who've had a loss of some kind or want to support someone they love who's had a loss, they can find me at findyourharbor.com. And that's Saltwater's URL. Perfect. Thank you, Margo. I appreciate you so much. Thanks again for coming on, sharing your book, sharing Jimmy with us, and sharing a little bit about your life as well as everything you do. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you again so much for choosing to listen today. I hope that you can take away a few nuggets from today's episode that can bring you comfort in your times of grief. If so, it would mean so much to me if you would rate and comment on this episode. And if you feel inspired in some way to share it with someone who may need to hear this, please do so. Also, if you or someone you know has a story of grief and gratitude that should be shared so that others can be inspired as well, please reach out to me. And thanks once again for tuning in to Grief, Gratitude, and the Gray in Between podcast. Have a beautiful day.